G'day, this video is sponsored, but shh, we'll talk later. This episode simultaneously sucks and blows. Sometimes I like to give a lengthy preamble before we get into things, but seeing as I've already georged you long enough on this one, let's dive straight into it. The episode which for some reason they named after the number of people interested in an animated show about the history of Yee-T. No one. Back for round three of the uh, play. I still like Lady Crane, and I'm a fan of this little through line of her writing her own monologue that's more captivating and in character than the original. And then the audience loves it, and she's all proud of herself. That's cute. It's genuine payoff that demonstrates Crane actually listened to and thought about what Arya said. Although, let's not get too excited. This is incredibly minor, and it hilariously deflates the self-insert defense to criticism these losers put into the previous episode. If Lady Crane was right about what her character should be doing, then hey, maybe so was Ian McElhenney. Who knows? You sad balloons. I also don't get how Isambaro allowed this to happen, given his outrageous display about it last time we saw him. For some reason, reason, right after Joffrey's death, the play jumps right to Tywin's death. Like, immediately after Crane walks off stage, Bonobo starts the next scene with What is that I hear and smell? Someone on soon sent to you can actually hear Isimbaro give Tywin's dying speech during the next scene. Not only is this absurd narratively, it also implies that both Isimbaro and this episode's writers thought that an outsider's perspective on Tyrion's trials wouldn't justify the screen time it would take up, about which they're wronger than I was for passing on Osha. I understand the lack of relevance such a scene would have for the purposes of this episode, but it's just crazy to immediately cut from Joffrey's death to the patricide on the privy, the murder at the men the shootout on the shitter. Why would Isambaro do that? We know that Tywin's death is the last scene of the play, so there's nothing more from Cersei or Sansa? There's nothing leading up to the climax at the crapper? Okay, I'm done now. Le denouement at the dunny. The promotional product placement in the piss take. Hi. As a person, it's likely you've encountered a situation wherein you're socially obliged or otherwise compelled to provide someone with a thoughtful gift. Boy, have I been there. Luckily, I recently discovered a surefire remedy to this problem, and by discovered, I mean have been paid to recommend. Today's nitpicking bonanza is brought to you by Underlucky Stars, who make lovely personalized star maps. If you don't know what a star map is, it's a map of stars. Specifically, the stars in the sky above a location of your choosing at a time of your choosing to commemorate a special moment, also of your choosing. Under Lucky Stars offers a very personalized gift. You can design the map from their catalog of templates, give it a special message, title it, size it appropriately, and then they print it on museum quality art paper to ensure it stays as lovely as possible for as long as possible. Seriously, this paper holds up for generations. Their proprietary stellar cartography method is verified by NASA astrophysicist and approved by renowned science man Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Presenting the stars like this isn't enough for underlucky stars though. They're also committed to making the actual stars, the real life ones, the ones above you currently, easier to see and nicer to look at by supporting and fundraising for the International Dark Sky Association. Obvious occasions to commemorate might be a birthday or a wedding or the day you survived swimming through a canal full of sewage. To test out under lucky stars, I surprised my brother with a star map of the sky above his wedding. Real. He and his wife appreciated it so much they completely forgot about the time I poisoned their lemon tree. So if you want a neat, novel, noteworthy way of remembering the best days of your life, visit underluckystars.com slash Glidus and use the code Glidus to get an exclusive 10% discount on a star map for you and slash or your loved one slash ones. Thank you, Underlucky Stars, for sponsoring the... this. Back to Not a One. Crane finds Arya hanging out in her dressing room. Following the events of the previous episode, Arya is deceased. But Crane can patch that up real good because she's a violent abuser. I got good at patching them up. And good at putting holes in them. <laughs> and that. <laughs> That's funny, it's funny. What she can't patch up though is the integrity of the show she inhabits, which is fair enough, I can hardly alter the fabric of my reality too. Aya's continued status as not a corpse has done irreversible damage to how seriously threats can be taken in this program from now on, especially those concerning herself. Like after she survived this, what conceivable scenario could possibly present any danger to her? And don't call it development, showing how strong strong she's become, becoming inexplicably invincible is not character development. For a show that so commonly makes usage of 
being stabbed a little, or the threat thereof, as a means of endangering its characters. This is mega problematic, and there's a lot to unpack here, Sweaty. I did this a little bit last time, but to inflate the watch time of this video, I'm going to list all the people who died from wounds equal to or lesser than those Aya survived. You know, those that Aya is deader than. Some of these will be debatable, but that's just to agitate you so you leave a comment about how you disagree. <clears throat> Robert Baratheon, this fat kid, Kotho, Khal Drogo, Renly Baratheon, Maester Lewin, J.R. Mormont, this white walker, Orel, Rob Stark, Dontos Hollard, Egret, Tywin Lannister, Mance Raider, Barristan Selmy, this white walker, his Darzo Lorak, Jon Snow, Doran Martell, Ario Hota, Maester Calliot, Julius Caesar, Roose Bolton, Rickon Stark, This White Walker, Boots, Edison Tollett, Rhaegar Targaryen, Buck Strickland, Euron Greyjoy, Daenerys Targaryen, Grigory Rasputin, and most funnily, The Waif. I'm sure there are a few more I could pile on, but note that I chose not to include anyone whose skull was pierced or whose throat was cut. <laughs> Cut his throat. Silence, Brind! But there is an argument to be made that Aya surviving her swim through sewage with open wounds to her digestive and circulatory systems would be more unlikely than, say, whatever the fuck this is surviving this. Maybe the secret to surviving certain death in Game of Thrones is to swim through a river of shit. <laughs> That according to this show's own treatment of this kind of injury, Aya is beyond saving. Definitely beyond an urban foot race, I would say. I guess the concept I'm describing is plot armor. This show used to not have it. In fact, it made quite the point about not having it. And now it has it in swathes. Or whatever noun in which you'd have armor. Abundance? A character's chances of surviving a situation are no longer anchored to their abilities, traits, capabilities, other synonyms that have been previously made clear to the audience, but are now tied to how much Dave and Dava would like to see them through their peril. Roose Bolton is a grown-ass man who knows his son Ramsay is a sadistic little bean, but because the plot requires him to be dead from now on, he lets his guard down completely and dies immediately from a single wound. Arya is a small teenager who died, but because the plot requires her to not die, she survives. Her training so far has been more being whacked with a stick and making shit up than being immune to sepsis, so her surviving this head-on conflict with the waif as we know her is unbelievable on the face of it. However, we want Aya back in Westeros for, you know, some reason. <laughs> Fuck you. Being all caught up in a death-based improv club and such, the story kinda requires some sort of murder-based confrontation with them before she can leave Bravos. And so, to achieve their goals of an epic fan favourite getting a win and lining things up for the desired coming plotlines, Aya survives. Not because of anything in-universe, but because of the writer's narrative objectives. Aya needs to make it to Westeros? Okay, well then she survives. That's it. Imagine if this thinking had been at play in Season 1. Ned needs to escape King's Landing to join Stannis? Okay, well then he survives. Fuck that. Obviously there's nothing wrong with writing the plot you want to write. If you have a specific narrative or dramatic goal in mind, by all means write towards it. There is some satisfying emotional beat achieved by all this. A girl is Arya Stark of Winterfell and I'm going home. But look at the price paid to get to it. Do I hate that Arya broke free from the cult and returned to Westeros? No. Do I hate that for that to happen, a shopping list of other elements in the story had to be a herd of sacrificial lambs? I don't know, what do you reckon? This is, unfortunately, what I would call my limit. Great writing happens when the satisfying narrative or emotional moments and arcs the writer conceives of are married to their characters' capabilities and motivations. Wouldn't it be cool if the crazy dragon dude got brutally murdered in a horrific way? Sure, sounds like fun. But how do we get there? Oh, his crazy dragon dude vibes vie for control against his increasingly independent sister and her outrageously sexy husband. Great! Okay, now, wouldn't it be cool if the fan-favorite girl boss fought for freedom from the cult of assassins and returned home? Sure, but how do we get there? Oh, she, she fucking dies, dies, that's how! Maybe she simply forgot to die because the canal was full of amnesia water. There, I said it, are you happy? Anyway, after joyfully reminiscing about that time she mutilated another actor's face, Saint Crane offers to let Aya join the company as they continue touring to Pentos. Aya bullshits a little when she asks why not, but immediately gives 
gives up. Come with us. What's left for you here? You wouldn't be safe not while she's looking for me. As though she couldn't just spin some more bullshit, which she has been specifically trained to do by an improv cult. If it were just that Aya can no longer bring herself to lie, reflecting her father's personality maybe, that would be fine and potentially dandy, as would her having now come to trust Crane with this sort of thing. However, both of these explanations can be immediately dismissed because Aya literally just spouted some dank lies to Crane. You should come with us. I don't think I could remember all of the lines. So yeah, I don't know. It's all in service of getting to this weird what's west of Westeros thing that Aya has A, never remotely shown any kind of interest in anything even tangential to prior to now, and two, that same thing but after now until the very last scene of the show because the writers were too chicken shit to kill her. Come on, kill her, it'll be fun! Now, as I outlined in a video one toddler ago, Aya was initially established as being unconventional and curious, but that was always more associated with like societal roles and shit rather than, you know, like tangible facts about the world. So this kind of just comes out of nowhere. Wait, given the show's last scene, am I supposed to believe that this single conversation with this mutilation enthusiast she was supposed to murder was more important to Aya than this conversation with her father? Can I be Lord of a whole fast? If you were crafting the ending for this character, which of these moments do you think would be a more fulfilling, more satisfying, and more appropriate thing to refer to? Hmm, should we hearken back to the crux of Aya's character being non-conforming and challenging to block your ears, kids? Gender roles, or have her die pointlessly at sea? To call these guys hacks would be an insult to workhorses. That's a joke for all the etymology nerds out there. My brethren, I hope you feel seen. Anyway, Aya drinks the heroin and the scene ends. Good on you for willingly entering a coma while you know a deadly improv troupe is out to get you. If my soup didn't kill you, nothing will. I cannot believe that this benign joke about English cuisine turns out to be actually a statement of truth. Wait, hold on a cheeky moment. Fuck an oath. She's shrine. Fair dinkum, I take it all back. Erstwhile, the lads are sinking the piss and having a laugh. Then I just chundered everywhere of that nature. When suddenly their friendly game of sexually harassing one another is rudely interrupted by the hound doing some murders. Honestly, I do like how this dickhead getting sack tapped with the business end of an axe kinda echoes Brienne's similarly genital based revenge kill on this guy back in season three. Other than that, this scene is quite bare bones. There's not too much to comment on. It shows us what Sandor's up to act as a vehicle for some badass one-liners. You're shit at dying, you know that? and fills the season's quota for laughing at male victims of abuse. Oh, I guess we kind of already did that. Fuck, that's bleak. Okay, so this is annoying. You know that one scene in season seven where Daenerys is all Well, this is what she was talking about. This single little speech is all we see of the Red Priests engaging with the Miranese public after Tyrion's discussion with the boob lady. Um... Smash. Smash. The people listening to her don't seem that invested, but Tyrion says, Call that a successful gamble. So I guess, yeah, the pact with Kinvara really did bring peace to Marine. Hmm, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm sure a crowd this big is really going to put a patch on you upending a millennia old way of life with your military dictatorship. At the very least, this scene remembers that Varys hates fanatics and practitioners of magic. But I guess he's not so skeptical as to want guards of any kind escorting them through the city which they've just invited said fanatics into to solve an issue of domestic unrest. Varys makes a decent point about the unforeseen consequences of Tyrion's deal with Kinvara. If you shave your beard with a straight razor, you'd say the razor worked. That doesn't mean it won't cut your throat. Not that those are ever explored, in spite of how cool it would be to see Tyrion's story parallel Cersei's in that manner, but of course... There's no time for that. So instead, true to form, Tyrion simply deflates the entire conversation with a half-assed turn of phrase. Spoken like a man who has never had to shave. Which A, isn't even witty, it just sounds like it is, and two, doesn't even make sense because Varys very clearly shaves his scalp and face. From what I could find, eunuchs don't develop male pattern boldness. Given that Tyrion's supposed to be smart, he does own an air fryer, after all. He probably should know about this study from 1960, so we'll call that a plot hole. Anyway, the plot of the scene is that Varys is going on some unspecified expedition they talk around for some reason. Why act like this? Why not just say, hey man, have fun on your trip to Dawn? It's not like they care about any bad actors on the streets of Marine, because again, if that were the case, they would have guards. I can't go off on a secret mission in the company of the most famous dwarf in the city. Oh, it's a secret mission now, is it? Maybe that's 
why they left themselves vulnerable to being killed again. But how fucking secret is it? Do Grey Worm and Missandei know? If not, won't they have questions? And shouldn't they be immediately suspicious that the city gets bombarded the very next thing after Varys leaves? If it's so fucking secret and you can't go walking around with Tyrion because he's too famous, then why were you doing exactly that? The most famous dwarf in the world. Fuck you, you pant. Just one pant. <laughs> Varys himself looks like foreign. Weak and with very female moves. Big Q interrupts Cersei, who was in the middle of a very important meeting with her wine, to bring her into a little weird confrontation with some sparrows led by Lancel, who Tomo let in. Adherents of the faith aren't allowed in without verbal permission, you see, like vampires or fire. Fire can't go through doors, stupid. It's not a ghost. So what, they're just gonna talk a bit? Classic mid-season back and forth pedestrian ponderous interchange where nothing much at all happens. Oh, a man dies. So Lancel has been sent to fetch Cersei because the huge sponge wants to talk with her at his new workplace. The implication is that Cersei will again be detained by the Faith because of course her house arrest in the Red Keep has been such an issue for them recently. Strangely though, I think Frank didn't actually want this to work because instead of sending his entire secret police to go do this, he sent Lancel and six friends to confront the notable deviation in elevation. Cersei says, He promised me I could stay in the Red Keep until my trial. Nee. And Lancel says, "New." Nee. Earlier in the season, Cersei was barred by the Faith from leaving the Keep, and now they're barring her from not leaving the Keep. The order of events adds up though, given that it would have been harder to indoctrinate Tommen if they'd imprisoned Cersei beforehand, but oh wait, they did do that. You know Cersei and the High Sparrow don't even talk to each other this season? It's a cool conflict, you guys. I like this shot from inside the drain. That's cool. Oh look, another opportunity for a showdown. Too bad Jamie's gone. One Sparrow is killed. One. In all of this. Since the very beginning. In this scene, violence quite clearly does work against them. Gregor kills just one of them, which causes the rest of them to flee, and most importantly, they don't come back. And yet Cersei just hasn't been using violence because why exactly? Then I'll remove the high sparrow's head and every other sparrow head I can find. You can't. Again, this torturously out of character behavior is only happening to set up a thing. For some reason, Cersei has so far insisted that violence won't accomplish anything, even though Though she's Cersei and hasn't even tried until now. And now that she has tried and it has worked, she continues to not use it to get herself out of this little pickle. Big cock. Now that she has seen that she can use Gregor and probably other means of violence to fight back against the faith, what's her new course of action? Blow everyone up, including most of her own family, and consequently cause her son's suicide. Oh gee, if only she hadn't pointlessly sent away one of her most useful assets two episodes ago to deal with some unrelated bollocks. Hey, speaking of, these tents look fucked. Anyway, these two peas in a podrick show up at Riverrun because Sansa told them to because Peter, a liar, told her that Grunkle Brynden, not that one, magically retook it and has an army they might want for their whole let's conquer Winterfell thing. Of course, having the intellect of a bag of frozen peas, Peter did not think that maybe his own army might be useful in this endeavor. Especially given that while Peter was on his way from the Vale with an untouched mega army, the forces besieging Riverrun were in shambles. <laughs> Given that his stated plan is to fight for the Starks against the Boltons, who are vassals of the Lannister regime, he might as well have freed up this imaginary Tully army and made himself invaluable to Sansa by relieving the Frey Siege of Riverrun. Like, why did he tell Sansa, who has barely any resources, to go deal with it after they met in Tull's Mound, when he could have done it with his huge fucking army that he just waltzed across the Riverlands with anyway? I guess it does mean asking Brynden to abandon his home, but then again, that's that's what Brienne has to do in this episode anyway. The most incredible part of this is that there's no conceivable way that Brienne could have gone from the walrus to river run on sentence without bumping into Littlefinger's army and presumably Littlefinger. As I said with Jon, giving an honor obsessed character like Brienne direct dealings with Peter would be so much fun. And right here is a scenario where the two not interacting is completely illogical. Like imagine if Brienne was like, hey, why don't you help the Blackfish with your army that you have? I bet 
at Sansa and Jon would really like it if you did that for them. And Peter's like, hmm, yeah, that sounds good, but what's in it for me? And I don't know, what if he like manipulated her into owing allegiance to him or like made concessions on behalf of Sansa? I don't know, would it be interesting? Looks like a siege, my lady. Podrick over here with a nat 20 on his perception roll, my boy. You have a keen military mind, Pod. Honestly, this one line is funnier than each of the dozen dick jokes made in this season. I like that Brienne completely zones out when she sees Jamie in the distance. As with the previous episode, Riverrun definitely takes the cake in no one. Sure, it's a cake of soap, but it still takes it. Speaking of horrendous toilet humour in my dragon show, Bronn harasses both Podrick and the audience in one of the absolute worst scenes of the season. At least the coup in Sunspear did the bare minimum of being scarcely relevant to the plot. Not only that, but this scene's crassness hardly communicates anything about anything and only serves to further entrench Bronn as but a single punchline. A punchline which could be funny if only it were being spouted by a character and not a Pez dispenser. The only redeeming thing about it is this face. I feel like I should stress at this point that we're only 14 minutes past the credits and we're already up to our third completely unrelated dick joke. Are we calling it a joke? You're the one with the magic. <laughs> they have to frame this reunion like this before we've even seen Brienne and Jamie together frame it around sexual tension? You really couldn't think of another way to fill these two minutes. Getting a bit old to be a squire, aren't we? Be gone with you, you anachronistic stain! Jim and Brian get down to brass tacks and it's mostly, yeah. A good amount of the criticism I could lay at this scene's feet would be regarding a lack of following through on the potential it establishes. For example, Brienne speaks of honour compelling her to fight for Sansa's kin against Jamie, and it's quite visible how conflicted this makes her feel. Seeing as the Blackfish kinda just decides to die for some reason, she doesn't really have to deal with that this episode, but the groundwork is there for a future moment where Brienne does have to stand in battle against Jamie, giving her an ultimate struggle between her dedication to honour and her personal feelings for Jamie in this case. I don't know why the writers are so obsessed with setting up perfect, juicy, defining moments for this character and then completely squandering them, but they do what they do and Brienne doesn't do shit during the war in season 7. Imagine if Brienne had been on this hill instead of Tyrion. Oh my god, that's another very easy way they could have drummed up tension between the Sansa camp and the Daenerys camp that they ignored. Sorry, that's it's not really this scene's fault, I just get carried away thinking about how horrible season 7 is. <laughs> Oi mate, you got a license for that dragon? In terms of actual critique of this scene, Brienne says, Lady Sansa desires to take her ancestral seat and assume her rightful position as Lady of Winterfell. Which is big time dumb, not only because Rickon is Ned's lawful heir, but also because she completely fails to mention the part of the mission that pertains to saving Rickon's life. You know, the son of the woman whose family she oathed to protect. Speaking of oaths, Brienne seems to think that she's fulfilled the terms of the Oathkeeper Oath. Here, take this priceless artifact. No, I couldn't possibly. This is strange because here's what Jamie tasked her with doing. We swore an oath. I was probably dead, but there's still a chance to find Sansa and get her somewhere safe. Ignoring that Brienne knows Aya is alive and has no reason to assume she's safe, there's still the issue of her thinking that on a warpath against the Boltons counts as somewhere safe for Sansa. My brain, as it happens, has turned to jelly. Yeah, her track record isn't awfully good actually now we think about it. <laughs> is the Blackfish just letting anyone into his castle now? Now, look. Asking Brynden to abandon his home, his family's castle, in the middle of a stagnant siege sounds pretty fucking dumb. Which is why I say Brienne probably would have had a better chance of this had she bumped into an army that was literally in her way, but I digress. So yeah, he says thanks but go fuck yourself. This is the flip side of the balance I was talking about earlier between logical consistency and, you know, cool shit happening. It makes sense for the Blackfish to turn Sansa's request down, but it's also really goddamn boring, and it kinda lays bare the fact that we're only here, in Riverrun, doing all of this, any of this, to get this one moment between Jamie and Brienne. Also note that Brienne informs Jamie, the commander of the Crown's forces, that Sansa, a mortal enemy of the Lannisters wanted for regicide, is going to attempt to conquer Winterfell from a Lannister ally, and he does absolutely nothing about this. God, things just happen in this world. I wonder if the tail end of this season would be better without this cobbled together Riverrun 
conflicts. Like, if instead of this, Cersei dispatched Jaime to go help out with the Winterfell thing, I don't know. She's exactly like her mother. Okay, yeah, this is cute. No notes. He gave me this sword to protect her. That is what I have done, and I will continue to do until the day I die. Wait, so the oath isn't over yet? What the fuck is going on here? Hey, everybody! An old man's talking! <laughs> Cut his throat. <laughs> Shut up! I did some dunking on the costume department in the D, and I failed to mention this in the Br. So now in noon, I feel we should take a moment to appreciate Brynden's black scale armor. <laughs> Appreciation time over! Next, Tommen abolishes the sacred tradition of the drive-by wombat. So this feels like an intentional blue balls moment. If this is in response to Cersei's use of violence, like, oh shit, we forgot she could use Greg, better rig something about that, to me that sounds like gross incompetence on the Faith's part, as though they hadn't realised she could do that until just now. Also, how long does it take to set up a trial? Like, just why hasn't it happened yet? I get that we need to delay it for the season finale, because because it's all big and epic and... But in world, it feels like the spy Harrow has just been twiddling his old little thumbs about for half a year. It's never addressed, like they mention a few times that the trial is coming up, but when? Every other trial in the series has happened pretty quickly after charges have been laid. Cersei was accused of regicide and incest over a season ago. What has happened in King's Landing since then? Come on, really, after all this posturing, what are we left with that's different from the end of season five? Um, Elena's gone. Jamie's gone. I guess Marjorie is playing along with the bullshit now. When you whittle it down like this, it's plain to see why this plot was so mind numbing. People just keep talking. I should have executed all of them. You know why we use the saves? I do appreciate these things just. can get a bit confusing in your family. It makes it makes sense. I'm leaving this no, we cannot make you. You cannot make us stay. You will take no action at all. What's happening? Oh my god, just shut up and do something! Take King's Landing in any previous season and compare its episode 8 to noon and you'll see just how little has happened in season 6 in service of properly accommodating the big thing. There was a big thing in seasons 1, 2, 4 and 5 as well. The plot didn't have to crawl to make room for them though. And sure, many of the main movers left King's Landing around this time but it's not like there was a shortage of potentially interesting characters to supplement this change. Speaking of potentially interesting characters, Kevin has decidedly become a Cersei anti, which is strange. Last we heard from him, he wanted to work with her, Jaime and Elena to get Lancel back from the Faith. Seems he's been marjoried off screen and now he's going to go along with all this bullshit to save his family. Was this due to the failed coup in Bloogie Blagi? You kind of have to assume. I'd have loved a conversation about Kevin's actions in relation to Tywin, like Jaime or Cersei call him weak and vacillating, you're nothing like our father, and he's like, yeah good, your dad sucked shit, give him more of a character beyond the occasionally sassy plot goer along with that he ended up being. Kevin Lannister is really cool, Ian Gelder did a fantastic job and I feel there were a lot of missed opportunities throughout this season to make him more interesting. Anyway, Cersei's not allowed to stand next to Tom out and we find out that the plot will be even more boring than we previously assumed while Tommen condemns his mother to death because his wife is pretending to be brainwashed. Cool. Kyburn tells the audience what's going to happen in the finale. Pig shit. Very cool. Okay, so for those who can't remember because you drink to forget the pain, this is the scene where Tyrion peer pressures his friends into drug abuse. Anyone not drinking is disrespecting our queen. <laughs> And then they exchange unfunny jokes until they're interrupted by someone who understandably wants to kill them all. The masters have come for their property. True and... Yeah, that's pretty true. That's true and... Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's pretty true. That's pretty true. I mean... That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. That's fucking true. Um, 
That's how it is, dude. Tyrion once demonstrated a cunning ability to see the world through the eyes of others and understand their experiences. This is how he could manipulate people or forge a connection with them. Here, he forces the way he likes to do things upon others, in spite of those around him telling him they don't like it. This scene is supposed to endear Tyrion to us, by the way, a character we all already loved. I know what'll do it. Have him awkwardly deliver a really shit joke. Spit it out, you wee shit. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Have him, I don't know, do a season one callback. I once walked into a brothel with a honeycomb and a jackass. Have him weirdly deliver a soliloquy about how he wants to gatekeep wine using a nickname he hates. The Imp's Delight. This is some fridge magnet shit, by the way. Yeah, the Imp's Delight. I'm sure you'll find that in the shops, thanks. <laughs> yeah, right. I think I've gone on enough about how horribly Tyrion has been written this season, so to buck a trend, I won't belabor the point just this one time. It feels weird that I'm on the same side as the slavers, but how could I not be when they put an end to this shit? Very cool of the Unsullied to wait until Tyrion starts telling the joke he's not allowed to finish before they start ringing the bells, which of course means they're surrendering. You lied to us. I make joke. Jimbo and Eddie have a chin wiggle, and I don't know if it's just because of its proximity to the previous scene, but it feels so good. It's possible that they put the best scene of the season right after one of the worst ones, and it's literally just two blokes having a chat. Turns out that when you let Tobias Menzies act, he's really fucking good at it. I want to know, I truly do. How do you live with yourself? The plot of the scene is a bit odd though. Jamie knows the Blackfish won't ever surrender, and though it's not mentioned, it's quite clear that a straightforward assault on River Run would be risky and costly. So he instead petitions Edmure to surrender for him. As we see, the plan is for Ed to ask politely to be let in, and once he's in command, the River Run garrison will give up the castle. Okay, great, but this plan is really fucking dumb? Because Jamie has no guarantee that the garrison will let Edmure in, and if they do, he has no guarantee they'll follow his orders. Brynden is in command of the army. Sure, Edmure is the rightful Lord of Riverrun by being Hoster's son, but as Jaime well knows, Riverrun was granted to the Freys by royal decree. Walder Frey is the Lord of Riverrun. Brynden Tully conquered Riverrun and commands the forces that hold it. Makes you wonder how the fuck the Freys lost it in the first place. And Edmure has no actual power, no actual command in this situation. Jaime is banking on random guards disobeying their commander, and as Brynden explains, this is fucking absurd. You're obeying the fucking Kingslayer's commands. And yet they do let Edmure in, in effect doing a mutiny on their commander. And as Black Walder explains, if You're wrong. We've just surrendered our most valuable prisoner. And, and there is no reason to believe that Jamie isn't wrong about this. Sure, through his threats he can bank on Edmure trying to make them surrender, but that's it. That's all he has. It was a dumb gamble and I'm annoyed that it just worked. Director Mark Mylod speaks of this moment cementing Jamie as the true truly cunning military mind Tywin expected of him. So intriguing to me to see Sir Jamie finally get a great victory and a very cunning one at that. He really has become the, the leader that his father wanted him to be. A stupid gamble. I'm further annoyed that in spite of Brynden's utmost commitment to never surrendering Riverrun, he chickens out when he sees that his men are inexplicably disobeying him. Not even a cut his throat. And they just let him sadly walk away. Oh cool, I thought when watching this for the first time six years ago. They're setting him up to have an epic last stand against Jaime when the Lannister Frey army enters the castle. Uh, but, but yeah, no. He died, sir. Off screen, they say. Lower the drawbridge! I do have to commend that they deadass built a functional drawbridge for like three minutes of screen time. Every facet of this production is brilliant, except for the most important one. Lamely, the Blackfish leads Brienne and Podrick to a cute little escape creek and decides to die for no reason. He says it's because he fled at the Red Wedding and that Brienne would serve Sansa far better than he could, which both appear to be complete non sequiturs. You can flee more than once, man. I'm up to like 27. And not only only can you and Brienne both serve Sansa, by what metric have you evaluated that Brienne, who you met a few minutes ago and has only ever failed in your presence, would be better at that than you, a seasoned veteran commander? You piglet. I expect I'll make a damn fool of myself. You bastards, how dare you do Clive Russell like this? I rag on the Blackfish's portrayal, but man, the casting was good. It's that missed potential of how excellent the character could have been that really digs at me with this. Jamie waves Brienne goodbye and 
and they make it out completely unscathed because he's the only person looking in that direction, I guess. How much better would this have been if she and Pod had been taken prisoner when the castle was captured, and against the advice of everybody else, Jamie binds them to a new oath and lets them go? Kinda might remind you of something. God, just imagine if Brienne made a plea to Littlefinger to help them, indebting herself and by proxy Brendan, Sansa, and John to Peter. Imagine if anything but the blandest, most straightforward, barely rational story happened here. The things we do for love. I clapped! I clapped when he said it! The tent scene, which is otherwise great, also has this. I love Cersei. She needs me. And to get back to her, I have to take River Run. Jamie's stated motivation sounds kind of fucking silly when you put it like that. After you were barristered, no, not like that, Cersei conjured the issue of River Run to basically get you out of the city so that the plot could happen. It made little sense to send you here in the first place, like it kind of happened on a whim, but here you are saying that completing this task is imperative to your relationship. You even fought against her making you do this. You've only voiced apathy and begrudgment that you're here at all, but now it's I have to take River Run. It's literally my only purpose in this world. And I know he's trying to send a message to Edmure here, but the line puts into perspective how out of place this entire River Run escapade is. It's like they took the skeletal trappings of the plot in Feast, but neglected all the things that made it, you know, make sense. In the book, Jamie says, I swore an oath to Lady Stark, never again to take up arms against the Starks or Tullys. If I have to slaughter every Tully who ever lived to get back to her, that's what I'll do. Dude, what if this conflict was built around Jamie's conflicted interests? His love for Cersei compels him to storm Riverrun and kill the Blackfish and Edmure if he has to, to secure crown rule of the region, but his admiration for Brienne and Catelyn and his growing sense of honour compel him to never take up arms against the Tullys who are simply fighting for their home. We even had an entire scene that reminds the audience that Jamie cares for and respects Brienne. But no, instead we have this dumb fucking ploy which somehow works and nothing really happens, nobody really grows. Rose. Even Nikolai seems confused by this character's direction. He loves her. What about his sister? That's... I don't know what that is anymore. <laughs> All that really took place in this waste of space plot was that Jamie left King's Landing long enough for other shit to happen, and Brienne left the North long enough for nothing to happen. Remove this entire subplot from the season, pretend that Jamie and Brienne simply vanished for a few episodes and popped back into existence at the start of season 7, and fuck all changes. I cannot believe you, Dave, other Dave, squandered all the opportunities these characters in this circumstance presented. Wait, yes I can. Of course you did that. In short. River Run is the best part of the episode. He died fighting, my lord. Oh no! Anyway, the siege of Marine happens. Unfortunately, none of our protagonists have died yet. I was wrong, I admit it. Oh jeez! Who could have seen any of this coming? I would love to see Missande or Grey Worm wondering where Varys is. Like, that's pretty straightforward. It is good to see Tyrion put in his place finally, but this just makes it stranger when he's given even more power and trust after this is all resolved. Wormo's strategy is good. The entire point of having a fortified palace is that it's much harder to capture than a generic settlement is. They would be shit out of luck if the masters had Grey Worm's nephew to sneak in and tell them to surrender though. Cut his cheeseburger. Anyway, Daenerys comes back from doing some other stuff. Did you remember to pick up milk? How can these Unsullied see that it's Daenerys before Wormo can? Like there's this little narrow entrance she walks through and you can see in this shot that Grey Worm can see out of it and yet these dudes are on their knees while he's still like, where do I stab? So I don't know, I've come to terms with time being non-linear in this show, I'm just not ready for the same to be true about space. Imagine this being the way you return a character to their city being attacked when they have a dragon. Shouldn't this be heroic and monumental and not lackluster? Like, she just walks into the room. <laughs> Where do you think she stopped to get her hair done? What are these reaction shots? Duh. Hmm. Duh. What the dog doing? The Hound is booking it through the Riverlands. I wonder if he'll bump into Peter's army. Mm, not quite, but he has a Brienne moment and bumps into exactly who he was looking for. It seems that this episode they've chosen to bring back these wacky dudes. We learn that Lem and his band of merry fuckwits were going around extorting and murdering innocent refugee communities because, oh, we don't learn anything. Presented with the opportunity to ask why Sandor of all people would be helping to build a sept of all things, Thoros says, You've got friends. Thanks, man. I really needed some fucking vapid dialogue around now. Like, come on, these guys know the Hound, and he's just told them he was helping to do something good for religious people. If I were Beric or Thoris, I would think he was joking. I 
I know stories are allowed to have coincidences, but it's just a bit much for me that the Hound somehow finds this lot in the 30 seconds between the execution being set up and the execution happening. Beric bargains to let Sandor kill two of them so as to prevent further conflict, and I think it's kind of funny, but why would he care who kills them? Sandor comes along, explains that he was affected by their crimes. Why wouldn't Beric just say, oh shoot man, you want to kill them for us? Insisting that he must execute them suggests that Beric has a vengeful bent, which I think is at odds with what we know about him. We're not butchers. If this is intended as commentary, it's good. If it's not, it's not. Sandy steals a corpse of shoes and settles in for a snack. I prefer chicken. Guys, quick! He said the he said the thing! Ooh. After a shot where you can see the hound's fake willy for a sec, Elder Don Darian tries to convert Sandor. You can still help a lot more than you've harmed Clegane. This sounds like some Brother Ray shit, you know, a sermon that convinces the hound to give redemption a shot. He seems to accomplish this by vaguely referring to a threat that as far as we know, Sandor has never taken seriously. The things we're fighting will destroy them all alike. The White Walkers are a joke in Westeros. One trip to the wall and you come back believing in grumpkins and snarks. And the Hound has only ever mocked Beric and his motivations. You found God, is that it? Piss on that! You're nothing but thieves. For this to latch him onto their cause is pretty silly. If it were framed more as him accepting that being with people is better than roughing it alone, maybe having learned from his time in Ray's community, that would work well. But it isn't, so it doesn't. Was it on purpose you had the horses deck and shot? Anyway, point is, Beric recruits Sandor to go north with them to fight the Blue Man group, which he's been aware of for some time now, but chose to hang around in the Riverlands so that he and the Brotherhood can... Um... Moving along, you all know this scene. It's still the worst thing ever. Isn't it strange how Lady fucking Crane gets the same level of grandiosity to her death as the goddamn Blackfish? Then the waif patiently waits for Aya to get out of bed, stumble down the hall, and gasp at Crane's corpse. Then she gives a fucking Bond villain monologue before it begins. I guess that was more important than just killing her. Now, okay, so, look. Okay, as I was writing this video, when I got to this point, the point where Aya, who is more stitch than person, jumps off a balcony and lands with a light thud and a tennis pro yelp, <laughs> I reflexively paused the episode. It was just too much. I could go on no further. To clear my head, I went outside and went for a walk for five months. Now that I'm back, I can conclude that anyone who praises season six has literally forgotten that this happened. I swear, the public recollection of these ten episodes is just cool fight and big green explosion. They don't remember Ilaria's coup. The King's Moot has fled their memory. They have neglected that for those two cool things to happen, King's Landing in the North moved slower than molasses on a glacier. Because if they recalled that this happened in Season 6, they would pipe the fuck down and concede that this tire fire of a season has nothing on the first four. Nothing. Anyway, I must have been woefully misled concerning what Milk of the Poppy is because Aya is handling all of this physical trauma like an absolute champion. It's either that or Lady Crane's soup has some serious shit in it. Potatoes! Got potatoes at the end of my potato feet. She fucking scrapes her butchered gut along this cobble alleyway and just gets back up and keeps going. Now look, I can't speak as an expert on this because I've never experienced that level of adrenaline. But then again, I've also never experienced that level of sepsis. Why in this situation would the waif be chasing after Aya instead of using her magic face-changing bullshit magic to blend in and ambush her? The fact is, it worked the first time. That's what the point of the mask is. <laughs> Guild of Sneaky Master Assassins, by the way. Yeah, this was directly influenced by the Terminator. Ah, uh, yes. That's what I always thought Game of Thrones was missing. Arnie. After going out of her way to disturb as many fruits as possible, Aya remembers that she's dead. She stumbles into her modest inner city apartment and the waif closes the door because that's what the script said to do. Yeah, wouldn't want this violence to be public, would we? Aya cuts the candle in half to put the room in total darkness. She does this because she trained while blinded by the faceless men, and she can be confident that the waif is at a serious disadvantage here. Because of course the waif hasn't also been trained by the faceless men, so she definitely wouldn't have been trained blind. It's not like she can do the other thing the faceless men do. I... <sighs> Okay, whatever. Fuck it. The Waif is somehow an even worse assassin than Aya is, so I guess the main character wins. She's waiting for Jacken in the Hall of Faces to 
t- tell him that she's leaving. Maybe raid his medicine cabinet a little, see if he's got any band-aids. Or a Gregor of painkillers. Finally a girl is no one. What? No. What? Shut up. F- fuck. Fuck you. This whole Bravos thing was meant to be fun. A girl is Arya Stark of Winterfell. And I'm going home. This is my fault. If Arya gets to go home, then why do I have to stay here? Man, I took longer to recover from the Waif's attack than Arya did. <sighs> what can I say? Noon is certainly an episode that exists and that I hate. What even happens? Well, Tommen cancels cool fights, Tyrion finally shuts the fuck up, three characters die off screen, two plots die on screen, the Hound takes a piss, and this strange red liquid is oozing out of my ears. But we mustn't let small issues like that stop us. Two more to go, and they are doozies. Fuck, and thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and signal surrender by hitting the bell to be notified of my crucifixion upon saying I don't like Battle of the Bastards. If you care, my band has released some more music since last time. In fact, we've released music even if you don't care. It's not conditional on that. Th that'd be weird. Here's what it sounds like. That was one song, here's another one. Keep all the memories of man. It's really good, I swear, and there are links in the description. I want to bigly thank those who have supported me on that one website while I took forever to make a video. Because I missed a few months, I'll be listing everyone who pledged at the highest tier since the last piss take. Agla here, an army of bees, Org, Aviator, Buster, Candy Warhol, Danza, Hertog Apple, Ingvold, Jamez, Joshy Bear, Hail the Orange, Hoveram, Jobly, Magnus, Mira, Mormoths, Mutskun, Nurse Ratchet, One Inch Walrus, Patchface, Polly, Sir Jewel of House Weald, Shrimper Jr., Simcoe, someone who asked me not to say their name, Stay78, SCL Guna, Waffle, Yen, and of course, how could it not be, Ondi. Oi bruv, you got a license for that press plate stretcher? What? Um, that's it. The video's over now. You can leave. Cut.